Turn it on. Well, it's it's where I go. We got the remote. Yeah. I'm going to just make sure here. You know what? It's okay. Well, it's time for us to get started. I'm uh, excited to be with you this week, having this opportunity to study some more about God's Word. We are talking about the Christian and suffering this week, these four days that we have together, Monday through Thursday. And we're going to start today by talking about an unseen problem in the church. And years ago, I did this as a seminar at my congregation that I preached at in Somerville. And I gave out a bunch of sheets of paper. And if I had thought about it ahead of time, I would have tried to do something similar here, but I just didn't think about it in time. But I asked our members to write down anonymously some struggles that they were going through, things that they were facing that no one maybe knew about. And we are often more inclined to be honest when we have the anonymity behind it. And so we found out some problems that our members were struggling with that none of us would have expected. And I believe that's the case in almost every congregation. If I were to ask you today to do the same exercise, I believe we'd find out some things that maybe no one would expect to hear because suffering happens to everyone. But this unseen problem in the church that we're talking about this morning is that unfortunately, in many places and cases, the church has become prone to neglect the members that deal with daily difficulties. And let me illustrate this for just a quick moment. When you think about the two events that happen in a congregation that usually spark a response by the church, it's usually when someone gets sick or when someone passes away. And those are both two events that we need to be heavily involved and invested in and helping out the people who are struggling with those no doubt about it. But at times, I can tell you that there are people in the congregation that maybe one of them has a disease like MS and they're bound to a wheelchair. And we see them on a regular basis and it gets to the point where it becomes normal to us to see them like that. And we forget that they're still struggling with something. We forget that they're dealing with that difficulty. And I'm not saying that they need to have food taken to them every week or anything of that nature, but oftentimes, if we're not careful, the only two times that we will respond to an event is when something happens that we consider to be out of the ordinary. Someone gets sick or someone has lost a loved one. And as I thought about this a couple of years ago, I did a survey and I asked several people to take it. And I got 12 different Christians to agree to take this survey. And I asked a simple question. Does your congregation have a program in place for members that are struggling with depression, with daily difficulties, with whatever, 11 of them said no, that nothing had really been put into place to try to help with these, these difficulties. And one said that they get them in touch with a trained Christian counselor, which is honestly the best thing that you can really do for people who are struggling with something like that. But out of the 12, 11, so they didn't have anything. And I would imagine a lot of other churches would have the same answer because we just don't think about it much. We have gotten to a point, it seems, where church and being the church is more about worship than it is about what the church actually does. Worship is a part of what we do. It is not all that we do. And so as we talk today about these unseen problems that we have, I want to illustrate to you that we need to think about caring for everyone in the church. And I've been privileged to be involved with several different congregations in my lifetime, about five or six that I've had the ability to worship with and work with in some cases. And at every single one of them, I can honestly say I didn't get along with everybody, nor do you get along with everybody here, I'm sure. That's just kind of how life is. Personalities don't always mesh together. We don't always get along. Maybe we don't have the same likes and interests, and therefore it's going to be harder for us to spend time together. And there are naturally times where you find somebody that you get to spend time with very easily. It is not difficult at all. When we were in preaching school, Megan and I, we were told in class, at least I was told in class, that you need to find your best friend for the rest of your life, and you'll probably find them in your class. And I did. We found a good brother by the name of Tate Sutton and his wife, Kayla, and we are peas in a pod, just absolutely best of friends. And we don't see each other all that much. But when we get together, it's like nothing changed. 
we just pick up right where we left off. And yet there are other classmates that I had that maybe we just weren't as close as we were to the others and we can spend time together, but it doesn't feel as familial as it does with the people that we gel with the easiest. But as my brothers and sisters in Christ, I still have to look to people and ask the question, what can I do to help them? What do they need that I can provide? And at times that even means helping the people that might have wronged me or wronged you. Not every church member is nice, unfortunately. Not every church member is actually doing what the Bible says about being a Christian. Sometimes they allow personal vendettas and personal problems to creep in and really get at them to the point where they don't care about you. But they're still your brother. They're still your sister. And you have to help them. And so as we think about this, I want us to point out in the first place, if you'll go with me to Galatians chapter 6, I want us to point out, number one, that we are supposed to care about every person in the church. Galatians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, we're told that we need to be a burden bearer. And this is an odd concept to really think about because the burdens that you and I face today are not of a physical nature, but much like Jesus would often take earthly examples and make spiritual application with them, Paul talks about this very mentality, and he starts in verse number 1 by saying, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And we're talking about two different things here in some ways, because we're going to get to verse 5, and we're going to have a different type of burden bearing being discussed. We're talking in the first place about someone who's overtaken in a fault. That word overtaken means to be caught by surprise. You weren't expecting it. A couple of years ago, we had a church member that moved to a new house, so we had a housewarming party at the building for them, and I drove a Prius back then. I have a truck now. You'll know why I have a truck when I finish this story. And as I was driving home that night, I looked down to change the radio volume just a little bit. I looked up and there's a deer right in front of my Prius. And I did the best that I could to stop, but I hit that, I hit that deer probably going 40 miles an hour. It was a wonder that I didn't wreck completely, but I kept driving. You know, the adrenaline takes over when you're shocked by something. And I woke up at my house. I don't know how that happened. But I drove all the way home because I was so scared by what had happened. And I got out and I looked at the damage that had been done to my Prius. And I thought it might be time to get a truck. And so I went and got a truck. And I've driven a truck ever since. And I think about that idea of being overtaken, caught by surprise, the same way that I felt when I saw that deer. I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't thinking that it was going to happen. And yet there it was. <laughs> And there wasn't anything that I could do in that moment to stop it from happening. But we're talking about someone that maybe we don't expect to be caught in sin. How many places do you think have had a preacher caught in sin? I mentioned in the Bible class on Sunday that we had two examples of people who were preachers in the Lord's church that were devastating the communities that they were in and that they had given the church a bad name and reputation but it's not just preachers. Unfortunately, I've heard of elders that have run off with women and committed adultery and left the church. I've heard of deacons doing similar things. I've heard of elders, deacons, members, and preachers all the like just leaving the church altogether. And no one expects it. We often look at people and we think that there's no way that they could ever struggle with that. And yet, Galatians 6.1 says they're caught by surprise. They're taken in a fault. And we who are spiritual, the ones that remain, that are faithful to God, are tasked with going and restoring them. That's because we care about them. That's because we love them. And so in order to do that, we have to think about verse 3 and verse number 7. In Galatians 6 and verse 3, it says, If anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. You want to talk about an underrated verse in the Bible? an underrated verse in the New Testament. This verse is really a theme verse for every Christian that needs to have this as a part of their life. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he's nothing. When he's nothing. That's not a small thing that's being said here. 
We're being told exactly where we stand. We are not special in the sense that we are above committing transgressions. We're not special in that the devil will reach a point where he looks at us and says, well, I guess I can't get them now. If the devil will go after Jesus, won't he come after me? Won't he come after you? He will. And then in verse number seven, we're told, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Oftentimes, you and I have heard this verse uh, taken out of context. Well, whatever a man sows, that's what he'll reap. And we use that by saying that if a man sows sin to his life, he'll reap the consequences of that. And yes, that statement is true. But I was taught and drilled into my mind at preaching school that context matters. And what we're talking about contextually speaking is not about a man who has sown sin to his life, but someone who has denied helping someone else. Someone who has not borne a burden for someone. And they can't be shocked if they're not a burden bearer themselves, if when trouble comes to them, no one comes to their defense. That's what the verse is saying. That's what we're talking about. And so, honestly, if you know of someone that is, I guess what we would call a Scrooge, and somebody who doesn't like people, doesn't really treat them nicely, and doesn't go and help people when they need it, can they really be upset if no one comes to their defense when they're in trouble? They really can't because they've done that to themselves. That's what this verse is saying. It's telling me to be careful that I don't get to a point where I look at other people's problems and say, that's not a big deal. But then when I face my own problems to say, well, where is everybody? They're not there because you weren't there for them. We have to remind ourselves that while Galatians 6 and verse 5 tells me that there is a burden that I'm expected to bear that no one else can bear for me, that's my salvation. We're not talking about that in verse number seven. We're talking about helping people. And if I won't be someone who helps others, I really can't be upset if no one wants to come and help me. But we shift to a focus now of how we need to treat not just everyone as a burden bearer, but we need to treat everyone like they were Jesus himself. A long time ago, years ago at least, there was a song put out that not all of the song is something that I would really want to agree with as far as the idea of the lyrics itself, but the main message of the song I think is important. You ever heard of the song, What If God Were One of Us? And you think about what that song is really saying of how would we treat people if we knew that they were God? And in James chapter 2, we're told about this sin of partiality where people would look at one person who looks nicer than another and give them preferential treatment. They'd say to the person that doesn't look as nice, I mean, you sit down here at my footstool or something, I guess we'll find a place for you. But the person who looks great, let me give you the best seat in the house. There are unfortunately people who would treat Jesus nice, but they wouldn't treat his creation as nice. In Matthew chapter 25, if you want to go over there with me, in verses 31 through 33, we're told about a king that's going to have these nations gathered and the shepherd dividing the sheep and the goats. And if you pick up with me in Matthew 25 and verses 34 through 36, we find that the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? He says in verse 35, For I was hungry, and you know what you did? You gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was without clothing, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, you came to visit. And then the righteous respond, and they say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? When did that happen? We've never seen you in that way. When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothing and in the need to be clothed? When did we see you sick or in prison and come and visit you? That never happened. And the king responds in verse 40 by saying, as often as you did it to other people, it's as if you did it to me. As many times as you treated other people like it were the king, it's as if you were doing it to me. And he turns to the left and he says to them in verse 41, Depart from me, you cursed into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And he says the same thing, but he just changes something. He says, I was hungry 
you didn't give me any food. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't take me in. I was without clothing, you didn't help me. Sick and in prison, you didn't come visit me. And then they also answered and said, well, Lord, when did we see you in this way? And he says in verse 45, inasmuch as you did not do it. And notice how he puts it, to one of the least of these, it's as if you didn't do it to me. You didn't even do it to the person that you would consider to be the least. But the principle of the first shall be last, the last shall be first, as far as God's people are important no matter when they come to the kingdom, or even as we think about James chapter 2, God's people are important no matter what their social status and financial status is. The king says, the least is still like me. And you didn't do it to them. And it's as if you didn't do it to me. And therefore, you're going to be taken away. And the question that has to be asked is, which hand are we on? The right or the left? And we know what we want to say. And we know what oftentimes we strive to say. But there are times, unfortunately, in my life that I can admit that I'm not on the right hand as often as I should be. And perhaps you would say the same, that we find ourselves on the left hand more than we need to be. And in one of the easiest ways that I can illustrate this to you is even with people huh, that are not Christians. How many of us have looked at someone and thought they won't become a Christian? That it's beyond them. Look at the way that they're dressed. Look at the way they look. Look at how they're acting. They won't become a Christian. And we look at them as if they're some second-class citizen that has no worthiness for the gospel and we forget that we ourselves are not worthy of what we've been given there's never a point in my christianity or yours where we will face a time and say i have finally earned what god has done for me it's a gift it will always be a gift no matter how many things that i do right i will never be deserving of what was given and if i can have it anyone can that's the message that's really being illustrated here in Matthew 25. And we want to say the right. We want to say that we're on the right hand. But too often we find ourselves not where we need to be. But the early church, as we shift to our second point here, the early church was caring. I don't know what it was like to live in the first century. All I know is what I can read. That's all I've got. We don't have videos that we can go back and watch. We don't have really even accurate pictures. They're, they're portraits, they're paintings. And unfortunately, a lot of the paintings that we see are not accurate for where they were in the country of, of their part of the world. You know, Jesus wasn't white, by the way. You know that, right? Jesus was not a white man. And we have all these pictures that are depicting an individual that is not what Jesus looked like. And so I don't have an accurate understanding except through archaeology and other things that have been found with artifacts and ancient pictures and maybe the writings of like Josephus of what it was truly like to live in this time. But I know one thing, they cared about people a lot better than we do today. And I don't know whether that was culture, whether that was just what they were or whether it was exactly what it needs to be. But I know this, even if it was culture, we've messed up by not continuing that culture. We think about a sports team that has a amazing culture and is able to continuously be ranked as one of the best teams in their sport and then the coach leaves and oftentimes what tends to happen is they don't hire the next person to continue that culture the person comes in and says you know what I'm going to do I'm going to change everything and then they're surprised when their team goes down and they wonder well what happened well, you took what was being successful and you said, let's not do that anymore and let's do this instead. And perhaps the church has done the same thing. But when I study the New Testament, I find this idea of caring. But really the word that we probably want to use more is hospitable. And that word's defined as a friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or strangers. And that covers all, things, all three areas that we need to be thinking about. Guests, those are people that we know that are the guests in our house, visitors, people that maybe we don't know well, but they're coming through and we're going to have them in our home and we're going to visit with them and strangers, people we don't know at all and trying to be hospitable to them. One of the things that we did at Somerville 
that I was heavily involved in was I did a lot of work with the local parks and rec group that was in Oakland, Tennessee. I was on the board, the advisory board there. I coached foot flag football for five years. And every time I coached a team, I met on average 10 to 15 new families. And at the end of the season, what we always would do is we would invite them for a end of the season banquet. Guess where we had it? At the church building. And we invited all 10 to 15 families and they, they all came. And here we are in our fellowship hall area. We're enjoying a meal. I invited our elders, our deacons that were there so that we could have some people that would be able to talk with the families and cover ground that I couldn't cover just by myself. I invited specific members that I knew had children about the same age. We tried to be strategic in getting it to the point where we had an opportunity to show how hospitable we were as a congregation. And in doing that, I had the right and opportunity after the end of that banquet to get up and say, we would love to have you come worship with us. Unfortunately, we never had anybody that was willing to come. But the opportunity was extended. And that idea of hospitality is, de is commanded. It should be a determination of all of us. And I can speak, thankfully, on another part of this before we get into the verses itself. Back in 2018, a local congregation, their building burned down. And these black brethren were now without a building. They were just two miles from our congregation. And we told them, there's no sense in y'all going anywhere else. You come worship with us. And for a while, their preacher, who just recently passed away earlier this year, was starting to struggle with dementia very heavily. And he was trying to be of the mindset of we're going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild. And we were of the mindset that there's no need to rebuild. We're together. This is exactly what God wants. We should just stay together. And we worked and we labored and we showed the love that we're commanded to show. And not because we're commanded, but because we loved them. And happy to say that in 2019, they placed membership. And we became a congregation of God's people that was truly what he wants throughout the entire world. And immediately, some of their men that were qualified became deacons. And we had this opportunity to show the love that can be found in the church of Christ when you do it the right way. And the number one thing that we heard from all of the members that came and placed membership with us was this. We decided to come here because you extended the invitation to come here. We decided to stay here because you showed us that we belonged here. That's what it's all about. And in all of the time in ministry, I am the most proud that I was involved in that in any small part that I was because that's exactly what it should be. And when we go to the New Testament, we find that very mentality of caring for one another. I'm going to just kind of rapid fire read some of these verses, but if you want to think about it as we categorize it, the Christians themselves are commanded to be hospitable. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 9, we're told, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. But in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, the Bible says, Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, concerning steadfastly in prayer. And this verse here, verse 13 distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. And the Christians themselves are commanded to be this way. Elders, in fact, we're told, and the qualifications of elders are to be hospitable. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 2, Titus 1, 7 through 9. And one of the reasons that that is so important and so vital is when you show kindness to someone, they'll open up. They'll change. The, the whole demeanor of them will become different. And if you show that kindness to the community, they'll be more inclined to want to come and be a part of the church community that we have and to be added to the Lord's body. If we show that to the members that are here, they'll know that they can stay. You know, there are churches where people go and they visit. Nobody comes and talks to them. They walk through the door 
and nobody says anything. They go and sit down and no one says a word, not the elders, not the deacons, not the preacher, not the members. And they get up and they leave. And then someone says, do we have any visitors this past Sunday? How would you know? How would we know? How would anyone know? Unfortunately, if we're not careful, we will give off a vibe to the community that we're not hospitable, that we're not people that care about each other. Because there's another thing that can happen too. Sometimes a visitor will come in the doors and everybody goes and they talk to them and they're very intentional with them and they help them and maybe that person is not a Christian and they study the Bible, they become a Christian and then the moment they become a member they see nothing but bickering and fighting among the members. And all of a sudden the facade is over. And we sometimes think it seems that if we can just get them to become a Christian that it's, well, you're stuck now. Now you got to stay here. That's not true. And if we're not found to be hospitable, no one will want to stay. No one will want to stay. We have to be hospitable to everyone. And when we are active in hospitality, do you know what truly happens? The church grows. Go with me to Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. I want you to think about this. We think about the very first time we find church work being done. And I mentioned it in the sermon last night that I've stopped using Revelation 2.10 as a verse for living faithful because this is a better idea of what faithfulness is in the church. And in Acts chapter 2, very first work that we find of the church is found in verse 42 and following. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers and then fear came upon all Every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, all who believed, notice this in verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They sold their possessions and, they do, and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. And so continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. A couple of points that need to be brought out here. The church treasury, as you and I know it, you know, you've got the budget on the board and you see what the contribution is for that week. And maybe at the end of the year, the elders will stand up and they'll say, here's what we're looking to do next year. Here's what our budget is. That did not exist yet in this time. They didn't have a church treasury when we first find them because they had never done it that way. And so when you read there in verse 44 that they had all things in common, and then verse 45 says that people sold their goods and gave them to whoever had need, that's the idea of church treasury. When someone says that maybe they have a need to help pay their electric bill for a month, maybe it's an older member, they've fallen on some financial hardship, and the elders say, we can cover their utilities, let's do that for them. That's what they were doing back then. But they did it in a different way. They did it by selling what they had themselves. And I think we overlook that because a lot of times the mindset is once it's on the board, it's no longer mine. It's the church's. But I need to think about that on Sunday when I write that check, when I determine what to put into the plate, that maybe someone that week will have a need and that I can help them with that need. Because that's what they did. Someone might have said, I need help because my roof is leaking and I don't have the ability to, to fix it. You know what someone would do? They'd go and they'd sell their clothing that they had that would fare a pretty penny and then they'd give that money to the person who needed it and say, you go fix your roof. Someone might say that they needed a massive amount of money and they went and sold their land and gave that money to the person who needed it. And as anyone had need, it was divided among them. Then we shift throughout the New Testament time and we find in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 about the idea of the church treasury starting. That a collection is taken up every week so that there's no gatherings when Paul would come back. And then we have 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7 which tells us how to give by purposing in our heart. God loves a cheerful giver. And when we do all of this, it's not just so that the lights in the building can stay on. It's not just so that the preacher can be paid. 
and that we can do the things that we want to do missionary-wise. It's also so that anyone in the congregation that has need can have that need fulfilled and can have that need taken care of. And what I find with the church is that they were doing that very thing, helping out people who had need, but they were going even a step further. They continued daily with one accord. They were all of the same mind and teaching. They were all together, fellowshipping with one another. They were worshiping by praising God. They were having favor with all the people they were helping. The church had a good name when they went out into the community. They weren't seen as people that weren't kind, that were unloving. They went where the people were that were religious. Have you ever wondered why the Bible talks about like Paul and the church here going to the temple? They went to the temple because they found people that at least had the understanding that there is a God in heaven, people that typically followed after the old law, and they're so close. And you have an easier time getting a study with them because they're already on the same mindset of so many things. You can get it to the rest of the way, and they went to the temple because those Bible studies were a lot easier to obtain because they already had a lot of the same beliefs. They just needed to get them to see the old law is not what we're under anymore. And they went to that temple together. And someone came up to me once and they said, well, I don't really understand why we have a Wednesday evening service. Let's just do it like the first century church did. It was just Sundays. I said, you know what? Let's do exactly what you're talking about. Would you go to Acts chapter 2? And I went to them and it says daily in the temple. And I said, would you like to start daily worship up again? I would. I think that's kind of something that we would be well to do, but it's harder to do. And I think God understands that. But they said, well, what is daily in the temple doesn't mean that. I said, it does because it says they were daily in the temple and they were praising God. They were worshiping. We have gotten to a point in some cases where our mind has gone away from hospitality, gone away from the mindset of the first century church. And as a result, the same things happened that would have happened to them if they didn't do these things. The church's growth has been stunted, has not continued. It's good to have things like this. I'm very impressed that a congregation would be able to and willing to have a class throughout the week that they're having a gospel meeting as well because while I know this is open to the community, it's for you specifically as the church here. And that's important. That's important to have to continue to try to grow and to push forward and to get beyond where we are today to be better tomorrow and to better the next day. But when we think about the community, when we go out and we see someone today, what are we going to do? How are we going to help them know that we are exactly what God wants us to be? As we begin to think about closing out today, I want us to think about some examples of caring for others that we find in the New Testament. And that word minister, we have unfortunately hijacked it. Uh, and we've attributed it to one person only, one group of people, preachers. But the word minister is simply to attend to the needs of someone. You know, the truth is that you're a minister too. Not a pulpit preacher, but you're a minister. You also have to attend to the needs of others and to be considering of the needs of the people that are around you. In fact, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6, you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. That's your service. Doing the work of an evangelist means that you fulfill your ministry. You're performing the service. You're expected to serve. I'm expected to serve. And when I think about encouraging ourselves to be more hospitable, I have to look at the examples of people that were found to be hospitable. And let's think about Onesiphorus. If you look at 2 Timothy 1 with me as we think about this man, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 16 through 18 that the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. And if you drop down to verse 18, it says, you know very well at the very end there how many ways he ministered to me at Ephesus. What about Epaphroditus? He's one in Philippians 2 and verses 25 and 29 that we're told that the one who ministered to my need, Paul writes, while he's in prison, and he says in verse 29, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. And this last part here is important too. Hold such men in esteem. We don't do it for the credit. 
we should never be involved in doing something hospitable to have credit. But one of the things that we did at Somerville that I really enjoyed doing that I'm going to miss getting to do every year, we had just started back in 2020, right before the pandemic happened. And we had what we have been calling the couple of the year. And what we have done is we pick a couple in the congregation that we feel best represents New Testament Christianity. And we honor them. And there's nothing wrong with doing that. That's desired, actually. And we find people that are hospitable. We find people who are hard workers. And we say, you are worthy of honor because you're doing what is expected of you. And while you don't think that you deserve this, the Bible says that you hold these people in esteem who minister to the needs of others. And Paul himself says in Acts 20 and verse 34, yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. You have to help those who need it. But the final one is Jesus himself. And I never had thought about this until I studied for this particular message, but go with me to Matthew chapter 14. This is where we'll close out the class today. Matthew chapter 14, verses 14 through 16. The Bible says here that when Jesus saw, and when he went out and he saw this great multitude, he's moved with compassion for them, and he healed their sick. Verse 15, when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. And Jesus said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. For the longest time, I always just kind of glossed over that. Never stopped and thought about what Jesus is saying there. But doesn't that puzzle you a little bit when you know what Jesus is about to do? Had the disciples been given the opportunity and the ability to perform this miracle yet by Jesus, were the disciples the ones that Jesus was saying, you need to be the one to make these loaves and fishes multiply? That's not what he's saying there. Otherwise, that's what they would have done. Why did he tell them then that you give them something to eat? Their mindset was not about caring for others. Notice what they had said. We need to send people away. It's getting late. And we need to send them away so they can go and get their own food. And Jesus says, why don't you feed them? Why don't you help them? And when you and I think about this in verse number 20, the Bible says they all ate and they were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. And that word filled means to satisfy the desire of anyone. And Jesus had told the disciples, you fill them. You helped them. What did Jesus understand that they didn't quite get yet? He wasn't always going to be there. And it was going to get to a point where they were the ones that were guiding the church and how to handle helping one another. And that's exactly how Acts 2.42 starts. They continued steadfastly in whose doctrine? The apostles' doctrine. The very doctrine of the people that Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And so when I read the rest of Acts 2, 42 through 47, and I find as everyone had need, it was divided among themselves. I can say with confidence that even the apostles sold things that they had to provide for the needs of the people in front of them. Mm -hmm. Truly now understanding the idea of you take care of them. Jesus knew that he was going to make the food appear and help these people get to the point of being filled. But Jesus also knew that the disciples themselves needed to have that same mindset, that same attitude. And these people were no longer sick, they'd been healed. And the disciples are saying, now that they're healed, let's send them away. Let's let them go on. And Jesus says, let's take it a step further. And I would venture to say that at times you and I will notice people that have needs that they'll struggle, that they'll have difficulties. And if we're not careful, we'll have that same mindset of the apostles. After four weeks go by, after someone loses a loved one, unfortunately, you know what we tend to do? We tend to forget. We forget about them. One of the practices that is very easy to do today with all of the technology we have 
is to set reminders in our phone, on our calendars, whatever it might be, for the anniversary of someone who lost their loved one. And I did that for as much as I could. And I can tell you with confidence, when I walked up to someone or I gave them a card that told them that I knew what that day represented for them and that I was praying for them, you would have thought I'd just paid off their debts. It meant something to them. And it's not because I'm so great. It's because that's what the scriptures teach. And when I show that to people, I get through to them. I help them. And it's the same with anything else, not just the losing of a loved one. But if someone gets sick and it gets to a point where it's a lifelong condition, it can get to a point where we forget. But Jesus says, you take it a step further. Even if they're healed, even if they get back to normal, they might still need you. And so you give them something to eat. You fulfill them. You help them. And that's what this is all about when we look about the Christian and suffering. The number one thing that I have noticed in my deep study upon this subject is the loneliness that usually comes with suffering. Even with people who go through the same thing as others, they feel alone. They don't feel like they're in it with other people. And the church is to bear that burden and help them with what's going on because if they're not careful, the person who struggles will eventually have the same question that we'll talk about tomorrow, which is why does God let this happen to me? And if God really loved me, I wouldn't be facing this. And the end result of that question is twofold. Either they will realize that that's not the case and they'll continue to serve or they'll do what so many have done and they'll determine that they need to leave the church. And we're the last line of defense to help them realize it's not what you think. We love and care for you. And we all can do better in that department for sure. I really do appreciate the time and attention that you've given me today uh, to talk about this with you. And like I said, tomorrow we'll talk more about the problem of suffering and how God handles that problem. Yes, brother. I think one of the problems that, that I have personally I don't have any kind of a background in mental health. Mm. And how do you recognize the struggles that people have to be real or are they just using the church? Sure. You know, it, it's, it's a struggle for me. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I expect someone, you know, that I've always taught, you know, pick yourself up and boot your ass and go on. Right. People can't do that, and, I, and I'm, I'm struggling with that. Sure. So it, it, it's a problem that we have, anyway. Right. We're and, going. And to take that one step further, as elders and as a congregation, oftentimes we're confronted, and actually we're dealing with one right now, a member that is struggling financially, you know, can't pay their utility bills, has nothing to eat, I mean, has no income, and as an as an eldership and as responsible for the finances of this congregation, well, and with limited resources, sure. how far, you know, do we keep riding that out with them? I mean, obviously, I don't want them to be cold this winter. I don't want them to be without food. I, yeah. But as a congregation, you know, we can only help so much, you know, and how, you know, so how far do you, you, know, right. you, you ride a month, two months, a year, 10 years, you know, how far? Right. You know, we do have scriptures that talk about the importance of doing the best we can to provide for our needs when we're able to. And if a person is able to provide for themselves and they don't do that, the scriptures say that if a person doesn't work, neither shall they eat. And it gets to a point where if someone is capable of going out and making a living and they refuse to, and I think we see that a lot right now in our country, mm. we have how many places that are short-staffed, how many places that say that they can't get stuff done. And if we don't have people that are having a mind to work that are capable of working, that don't have the inability to work, at a certain point it gets to the issue of it is on them at that point. Now, it's hard to know exactly when that is. I think that's different for every situation. And speaking to what you said, uh, we'll, we'll talk about depression. And I found a book. I, I was on a youth day. And they said, we want you to talk about depression to the teens. And I thought, well, that's going to be a great afternoon. And I went to a local bookstore, and I spent about four hours looking through different mental health books to try to find what I felt was the best 
representation, and that book is called Mind Over Mood, and I'll, I'll find that and I'll have it to be available to anybody as far as I can share the where you can get it, but it gives a really good, accurate representation of how to help mental health from both angles, from both the just the mental side, but also the side that sometimes requires help from physicians and help from a medical team that will be able to help you deal with that difficulty that's happening. And it is the best book that I have found that is from a secular perspective that can be coupled with the biblical perspective. But in both cases that have been mentioned, it is hard to know. It, it really is. The one thing that I can say too, if we do the best that we can and we find out on the day of judgment that someone was a liar, was that on us or was that on them? Yeah, it's on them. And so the best that the church can do is all that they can do. And then we hope and pray that they're doing it for the right reasons and we leave it up to them and, and really up to the Lord to be the best judge. But it is difficult. I, I can't lie and say that because we've all heard the stories where we lived it was I'm traveling from Texas to Florida and my car broke down and my dog died and my goldfish is, is sick and in the hospital and there's all these things being said. And how do you know that they're really telling the truth or not? And a couple of times we'd be able to say, well, what we do here is we don't give money out, but we have a local hotel that gives us a good rate. and We'll let you stay there for a night. We will take you to McDonald's and get you a meal and we'll fill your tank up. And a couple of times they said, well, we want money. We don't want that. We kind of knew then what they were about. And one time, one woman, I don't know what she thought would happen. She said, well, okay, let's go fill my tank up. I'm low. And they went to fill it up and they put a gallon in her tank. And she said, well, I thought I was low and had a brand new car and everything. And so there are going to be times where it's pretty easy to tell. Then there's other times where you help and you hope that you did the right thing and you hope that you helped them out. But I, the Lord is a righteous judge, thankfully in all of those cases, and we just have to do the best that we can. But I am thankful that we have this importance given to us and shown throughout Scripture that if we help people, that we won't be found to be in wanting on the Day of Judgment. And that's what it's all about. We can't help everybody, unfortunately. I wish we could. I wish we could be able to help every single person. But we help those that we can. And Galatians 6 and verse 10 talks about helping everybody but especially those that are in the church and some preferential treatment is given there to help those that are among the faithful. The other thing I was talking about, kind of back to what Phil brought up, as elders, well, even members, you know, we all ask everybody, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And everybody nowadays it seems to be getting more and more so, or more and more private, maybe, with, if, with it all or what, you know, Paul, I'm fine. I'm yeah. fine. Well, how do you read this? Okay. Right. I mean, it, if they don't open up to you, I don't know what they're struggling with. Right. And I mean, as best as I've tried to talk to them and try to understand and, and, and get to know them better, but still, I mean, if, you know, I mean, that's like Facebook. I wasn't on Facebook for years, but finally I had to because that's the only way I was finding out what's going on in the congregation. Right. I, I mean, understand. We were, that. Elders, we were the last to know. Right. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the class, and I, I'm not going to ever begin to tell an eldership how to handle it, but one of the things I have discovered is anonymity helps a lot. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. It, it shouldn't be that way. It should be that a member can tell an elder anything that's going on. But you're right. We've become more and more private. And it's almost because there's this stigma in our world today that if you need help, you're weak. And that's, that's not true. And in fact, Paul even said, when I'm weak, I'm strong. I, I take pleasure in infirmities when I'm dealing with them because I can become stronger by dealing with that. But we've gone the other way in our world. And it's <laughs> if you're struggling, you have the problem. It's all on you and, and you need to just kind of change it. And there, there's definitely hardships that go with that. I'm, I'm thankful that I, I am not an elder currently in this current world that we live in because I cannot imagine the struggles and difficulties that they face trying to help and the needs of the congregation. But we do the best we can. We pray, we, we hope and pray that the people will come and lean upon us and that's all we really can do. I think we dismissed this this morning with prayer. Now we can please. Father, we thank you for the days you've blessed us with, for the nice rest. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity and the privilege we had to assemble once again to study more your word. We're thankful, Father, for Brother Michael and for the work that he does. We pray, Father, that you'll have many years in your service.
pray that we can take the things we learn, that we can put into our lives, that we can be better Christians, Father, in this life and prepare for that next life eternally. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.